So good to have you here. Second Peter chapter one. We're in the fourth part of our series on first and second Peter. And this morning we are moving to second Peter. And between first and second Peter, it's been a couple of years since Peter's first letter made the rounds to the Christians who had been scattered because of persecution in Jerusalem. Now they're scattered throughout Asia Minor. But now when we get to second Peter, The persecution is amping up significantly because of Nero. It has gone from in 1 Peter, where most of the persecution was it becomes socially awkward to be a follower of Jesus, to you were an outcast to being a follower of Jesus, that you needed to worship the gods of uh, Rome in order to keep your job in the union and people were losing their jobs and they were being persecuted. Now it's really amping up in Second Peter significantly. Things have taken a very dark turn. The persecution has become life-threatening. Now you're even more so at risk of being put to death for being a follower of Jesus. So uh, in First Peter, he's writing to encourage them because they have been scattered. But in this second Peter letter, he's addressing a more insidious threat. False teachers have infiltrated the followers of Jesus, these communities of believers who have been scattered throughout Asia Minor, and he's concerned about these false teachers infiltrating the life of the local church, sowing seeds of doubt, twisting the truth, leading people away from their faith that caused them to be scattered. Now they're struggling with it in this second letter of Peter goes straight to the heart of these internal struggles in the communities of followers of Jesus because of these false teachers. So Peter is not mincing words at all. If you read it this week, you will see that he is denouncing lies, the manipulation of the false teachers, their greed in driving these false teachers out. This letter is Peter's urgent plea for followers of Christ who the persecution has went from them being scattered to now they are potentially at risk of losing their life over being followers of Jesus. In 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 14 and 15, Peter even points this out, for our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me that I must soon leave this earthly life. So I'm going to work hard to make sure You always remember these things after I'm gone. You can stop there. Peter knew he was going to die. The signs were there. God had had given him a glimpse that his ministry was not going to last much longer. How much longer? He didn't know. He didn't know if there was going to be a letter of 3 Peter sent to these believers, but he believed that this might be his last opportunity, his last letter of encouragement, his final message to these scattered believers, the last chance to speak into their lives. So in this second letter of Peter, we want to be aware he is determined based on what's happening in the life of believers at that point in time, he's determined to share what matters most, knowing that they might not ever hear from him again. So let's, let's pay attention. Let's lean into second Peter. Let's, let's grasp the urgency, understand that as he's writing this, he's, he doesn't know when, but he knows his ministry is going to end before long. So where is the attention? Right out of the gate, where is the attention of Peter? Imagine him sitting there writing this letter that's going to be sent to believers everywhere over the next several months. They're going to be reading it in other places, and he pictures himself in those rooms where this letter is being read and he's going these this is what I want you to know right out of the gate first Peter or second Peter chapter one so let's turn our attention back to his audience his first audience those scattered by persecution they're living on the fringes throughout Asia Minor they're they're craving safety they're they're craving peace They're craving the financial security and financial abundance that they had, that many of them would have had in Jerusalem. They long for a deep sense of just personal security because now not only are they scattered, but their lives are potentially at risk, just as we uh, know from tradition that Peter was going to be killed for his faith in Jesus. 
Uh, They wanted the blessings of Jesus to flow in their life. Peter knew that they wanted that. But what Peter was also aware of of these Christians who had been scattered is that many of them, now a few years later, they were hesitating probably because of the risk of more persecution and the risk of their life, many of them are hesitating when it comes to putting in the actual work for personal growth. Their mind is so focused on how dangerous it is to be a follower of Christ that they've actually paused on putting in the work of their spiritual growth. So in chapter 1, verse 2, Peter tells us that God is offering an incredible, limitless treasure of grace and peace. But to access it, they need to put the work in. They need to grow in their experiential knowledge of who Jesus is. Yes, you believed in him enough that you were persecuted enough in Jerusalem to be scattered years ago, and now you're making a life for yourself in Asia Minor. Nero is amping up the persecution And your attention is turning to that, but in my final days, probably my final words to you, I want you to know that in God's grace, he's given you everything you need to live a godly life, but you need to continue, even in fear of what the world may think about it, you need to continue to grow in your experiential knowledge of who Christ and his church is. When we accept Christ, It's not just a fresh start, it's a complete transformation. We're theologically aware of this. We know it's not about trying to be godly on our own. We know that we do not earn our salvation. We understand that we receive what he's talking about here in verse 2. We receive this overflowing fullness of God being poured into us, not because of anything we've done other than putting our faith in Jesus. He is doing that for us. He's making it available to us. We're tapping into his power, his strength, his holiness, and that changes everything. So look at verses three and four. And by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. And skip down a little, and because of his glory and excellence, he's given us a great, precious promises. These are promises that enable you to share his divine nature For you, not just to receive his grace and forgiveness and your path of being right to him, but these promises are also about you getting to participate in the nature of God, in the way that he created you, and escape the corruption of this world. And the corruption of this world is not caused by the divine nature of God that we are able to develop within ourselves because of the work of the Holy Spirit, the corruption of this world is caused by what? It's right there. Caused by what? Someone talk to me or I'm coming down there and talk to you. Caused by what? Human desires. That's what causes the corruption of this world. And that's what caused the corruption in your life and you become a follower of Christ and you just don't stop and go, thank you for your grace, I'm on my way to heaven. I sin every day in word, thought, or deed, so I'm going to accept this generational curse of anger in my life. I'm going to accept this generational curse of addiction in my life. I'm just going to accept this. He's saying, no, hey, here's the blessing of this promise. Here's the blessing of this grace. Not only are you made right with God, but you get to continue participating and having his divine nature developed in you. And he's not saying this to a bunch of people living in a Christian community, working at a Christian school, hanging out with Christian friends who have no concerns in their life and say, oh, all the things are just right for you to continue growing in your faith. No, he's saying this to people who lost everything, who fled from their homes and now their lives are at risk of of being martyred for their faith. He's saying, hey, by the way, here's what's most important to me right out of the gate in the opening of this letter. You guys need to continue living out the full promises that God has given you by developing your character of Christ's likeness. I can see them standing in that room like, what? I want physical protection. I want Nero to burn. I don't want Nero to burn me. 
I, I, I want the government to be turned over. I want everything in Rome to be flipped upside down. I want a follower of Jesus Christ to be made the emperor of Rome because then he can make laws across the land that will force people to, to leave us alone and we can be protected. No, what Peter says is, hey, here's what I want you to focus on. I want you to grow in Christ's likeness. Powerful, powerful thought in, in their world. Corruption was rampant. Persecution was brutal. Martyrdom was now a constant threat. And Peter's not posing an abstract question. He's posing the title of the series where the people are saying, and he's answering this question, in a corrupt world like this, where persecution of followers of Christ is real, how do we live in a world like this? If this is the world we have, how then shall we now live? And Peter says, well, faith isn't static. That's how you should live. Faith is dynamic. Faith is meant to be put into action. That growth is to continue happening in your life regardless of what's going on in the world. And Peter gets this. The solution is not the government. The solution is not in who's in power. The solution is not to set up all your little security fences. Peter says, I want you to focus on what you can focus on and between you and God and other followers of Christ. Grow in who you are as a follower of Christ. So he begins to lay out a roadmap in verses 5 through 7. He says, in view of all of this, in view of these promises, in view of that God has given you this grace, in view of the persecution that you face, in view of all this, verse 5, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence. He's given you the grace. Wait, you're telling me I'm supposed to supplement it with something? Yeah, yeah, you're living in that grace. Now, now you spend the rest of your life responding to that grace by saying none of the excuses of family, past, uh, culture, upbringing, nurture, none of those, th those explain things for me on why I think and act and behave the way I do, but they're not excuses for me. Now I'm taking on the character of God. So he says... Moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with patient endurance and patient endurance with godliness. People whose lives are at risk, he's saying, I want you to work on your patience. I want you to work on your moral excellence, your godliness. I want you to work on your brotherly affection. I want you to continue to grow in your love for everyone while it feels like everyone else is hating you more and more for being a follower of Christ. And he says, make every effort. Wait a minute. I've been saved by grace. I'm just going to live in his grace today. And, and just whatever happens in life, I'm going to respond to it. I'm going to I'm just, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to burst out in anger at my family again. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab that thing to change my emotions instead of dealing with, with what's causing these emotions and changing the way that I think. Instead of that, I'm going to reach for that, that food or that substance or that drink. or you know, I'm going to use that to control my, my mood and my life. But he says, no, make, make every effort. He's calling for a relentless, intentional pursuit of spiritual growth. If you were raised with any type of, of Reformed theology influence on your life, you will know it because you're already sitting there saying, well, yeah, but, yeah, but, but wait a minute, I just need to rest in God's, yeah, absolutely, we rest in God's grace. These people rested in God's grace. They were forgiven. He's the one who did it. Peter is, is right there with you. He starts right out with, God is the one who has put all of this in you. These are his promises he's given you. And, and then he goes on beyond your Reformed theology that you've been raised with that, that oftentimes stops there. And he says, make every effort. And if you think, yeah, but... I sin every day. I've been saved by grace. Yeah, but. No, but. This is Peter about to die saying your participation in developing Christ-like character matters. It means dedicating time, energy, focus, developing the qualities that reflect Christ's character. 
And that's Christ that he's describing, not you. He's describing Christ and says, because of these promises, you develop in those characters of Christ moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, patience, endurance, godliness, mutual affection, love. It's about, putting, it's about pushing aside and pushing through the complacency of your life and complacency of bad theology and resting where you are, resisting the temptation to coast fully engaging in an ongoing process of becoming more like Christ, not to earn anything, not to prove anything, but out of gratefulness for what God has given you in his grace. It's out of gratefulness that we respond this way. It requires conscious daily commitment to transform our faith. And this transformation of faith does not magically appear in our lives. That's why you can know someone who's been a follower of Christ for 20 years and they are the same jerk in private that they were 20 years ago. That's why. It's because they're relying on the promises, but they're not allowing their life to be transformed by the promises. That's why you can keep turning to the things to change your attitude or behavior instead of relying on Christ and changing the way you think to change your behavior is because, but because we're coasting. And Peter's not saying pick one of these and then work on it for a while and then pick another one. This isn't necessarily an exhaustive list for Peter. He's telling us that these, these qualities from the day you became a follower of Christ to today are constantly, you are making not some effort, not occasional effort, not minimal effort. You are making every effort, every effort with the grace of God, with the community. That's why participating in the community of church is, is one of the reasons it's so valuable for us is iron can't sharpen iron unless you're interacting with iron. Some of the more difficult uh, personality conflicts and, and, and uh, uh, snippiness and sarcasm and hate and disagreement that I've ever seen happens in the life of people serving in ministry together. And I go, praise God, it should. It should, because we're fallen, broken people. But when we're all coming together to serve in ministry with the focus of we want to become more like Christ and we run into those things, we deal with them in a healthy way. We deal with them with brothers and sisters in the church who are farther along than we are, and they come along and help us. It's, it's not a checklist that we tick off one by one and say, well, I, I got that one covered. I, I can't grow anymore there. Peter's addressing believers who have grown a little too comfortable. They've been lulled into a false security by slick-talking teachers, and here's in general what the false teachers were saying, and you'll see why Peter's passion for this is, is written so clearly you cannot deny it, is the false teachers were saying, hey, if salvation isn't based on good deeds or earning it, then why not live however you want? That, that's in general what the false teachers were saying that he's addressing in Second Peter. You know, because you've received this by grace, well, and, and, and you're secure in that, okay, then, then why not just live however you want? Man, that's very tempting, and, and don't misinterpret anything I'm saying. That's not what Reformed theology is. That's bad Reformed theology. That's not what Reformed theology teaches at all. But we tend to slide that way, and that's exactly what was happening in the church, is these false teachers were saying, then, then it doesn't matter how you live because you just have to rest in God's grace. And Peter's saying, no, yeah, there's grace there when you fail. There's grace there when you sin. You're secure in your relationship with Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is there with you. But you have to acknowledge that what's so important to Peter, who knows this may be the last time he gets to write to us, is saying, because of this grace that God has given you in these promises, you spend the rest of your life responding to it by making every effort to grow in the character of Christ. There should be a difference in you and the character of Christ this year than there was last year and the year before and the year before. And when you meet a follower of Christian, a follower of Christ that you used to know five years ago, and you get to run into them again and maybe start getting involved in their life again, you will see that they've grown in their character and Christ's likeness, and they will see that you've grown also. This isn't about earning your way to God, earning God's favor, none of that. I think I've made that clear this morning. I, I, I got to this next section of Scripture, and I, I got to this, and I thought, man, there's a couple different paths I could go with this 
message, especially with these characters, these character qualities that Peter lists here because it's so important to him that every follower of Christ makes every effort for the rest of their life to continue to grow in these areas. And because I've witnessed through my life so many of us that stagnate in these areas and just go, well, I'm a follower of Christ, it's all cool, don't worry about it. I thought, man, but an obvious direction to go here would to be do a little word study on each one of these and, and talk about how it plays out in our life and challenge us. But, but I thought, no, I don't want to go that way uh, with this message this morning because I, I, wanna, I want us to stop and do a reflection and, and get, uh, get it really clear for you while you're watching online or sitting here this morning. Get it really clear for yourself. Where are you in this? So I want to do a little illustration with you that I've, I'm naming Chopsticks and Beyond. How many of you in here can play the song Chopsticks on the Piano? Let me see your hands. You can play Chopsticks on the Piano. Any, uh, I, I see a lot of, the best I can see, a lot of middle-aged and older hands. We also have any younger people who can play Chopsticks. I can't see because your beard back there or the lights in my eyes. Who's sitting back there? I can see your blue shirt. You just had your hand up. What's your name? Oh, Nolan, would you like to come up and play chopsticks on this piano? You don't have to. It's an invitation, not an obligation. Yeah, okay, you don't have to. Who wants to come play chopsticks for us? Okay, I need two people to get up right now and come play chopsticks or I'm going to have to do a word study. <laughs> come on. Two people, come play chopsticks. Do you, any of your girls know chopsticks? I saw your legs move. Okay, 20 of you raised your hand. Two people, I'm not going to put you on the mic. You're not going to say anything. I'm not going to make fun of you. I just need you to come up and play chopsticks, or I'm going to pull out the Greek and Aramaic. Come on, chopsticks. Thank you, Kayla. Appreciate it. I need one more person that can play chopsticks to come up while Kayla's playing. Who's that? Nate, you play chopsticks? Okay, you can come. You can walk, come watch Kayla play. This will work. Yeah, give her a round of applause. Kayla, have a seat right here, just for a second. I'm go. You're, you're not gonna have to say anything. I'm gonna put this handheld mic back here, Matt, so we can all hear Nate online play <laughs> chopsticks. Let's hear you play chopsticks, Nate. Okay, show him one time and see if he can get it. What? Watch Kayla play one more time. Okay, here we go. <laughs> wait, 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 Nate. Do you play anything else on the piano? Uh, anything? Yes. Play. Oh my goodness. Let's see what he's got here. This was not set up. He didn't even know what I was doing today. Okay, so no, he doesn't play something else on the piano. Good answer. Kayla, you can have a seat. Kayla, you, do you play anything else on the piano? Let's hear something. I don't know what that was, but it, <laughs> sound, it sounded just... Yeah, it sounded a little offensive to me. I'm not <laughs> sure what was happening there. Do anything. It doesn't matter what it is. Is this for a lease or something like that? Is that what that is? Okay, okay, okay. You can go be you you, you can go be seated. Uh, that's pretty good, huh? Give them a round of applause. Shelly, will you come up here this morning? Because I know uh, you'll have the ability to make this happen. Shelly's a piano teacher for decades now. Uh, I'm going to pull, this is sheet music, eternal love. Go ahead and uh, play that. I'll, I'll tell you when to stop. And we're going to let that keep going for a minute, huh? We'll wait till she's got turned. That's 
good there. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead and have a seat right here for me. I'm, I'm going to let you go back down in a minute. We're not done yet. Go ahead and have a seat there. Uh, Dad, would you come on up here? <clears throat> I grew up around piano playing. You can move quicker because we're doing a sermon this morning and uh, people were here watching online. Go ahead and have a seat and play some fast hymn that will make uh, Don Lobdell want to jump out of a seat and start dancing. Oh, he wants a taller, taller piano. You hear me? Huh? Play a hymn, yeah. something upbeat that will get Don Lobdell up and dancing. I just feel like something good's about to happen. Anyone know that song? Show them how you rock a piano. Wait, stay right there. <clears throat> okay. I want you to play what Shelly just played. You have the music right in front of you. It's written exactly how to do it. <laughs> Wrong song. Get out of here. <clears throat> Shelly, I want you to have a seat real quick. Right here. Yep. No, no, have a seat right here. Did you hear? I just feel like something good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Wait, what? You can't play it? Why? I don't have the music. He can't play it with the music. She can't play it without the music. Nate Porter can't play anything <laughs> except guitar. He can't play guitar. Uh, wow. Wow. You've seen it, right? Uh, the person who sits down at the party and they sit down at the piano at the party and they play a couple songs. Like, wow, I, I got a test I want to run. I was not planning on this. Matt Davis, run up here. Don't stop. Hustle, hustle, hustle. You're sitting there. Move, 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 move. You leave soundboard back here. <clears throat> he just walked up and touched this piano this morning. And uh, I want you to start playing what you played this morning. He did not know I was going to do this either. <laughs> let's, well, let's see. Here's the guy that sits down at the party and starts playing this. He's going to kill me. Someone named Matt Toon. Yeah, come on, Brad. Matt, have a seat. Let's, do you know how to play that one? Let's see what Brad can do with this. He didn't know I was going to do this either. Here's the thing about Brad. If he doesn't know it, he'll figure it out right here in front of you. She's just a lovely girl. I love it. Give Brad a round of applause. That person sits down and plays the piano at the party like oh man that's awesome and then you sit down and say oh play something else and everyone claps and they smile for a moment for Peter that's where a lot of these people were in their faith that's where they were in their faith they they knew just enough and Peter's like well but yeah, you've been called to be a piano player, so you keep going from there. Sure, you can play a song or two. Sure, you can impress the crowd for a minute. But what about someone who's truly a pianist, someone who invests years into learning the instrument, who's mastered the basics and built upon them year after year after year? You see, there's a big difference in someone who can play chopsticks and someone who moves from chopsticks to playing however that's pronounced, is it for Elise or how do you pronounce that? Into playing the entertainer, 
and to playing to that and to working on the musicality and the notes and working on the rhythm. And, and those who learn to start playing by reading music have to do another stretch to learn to start playing by ear because they think it's just a natural gift that people have. Some do, but you can learn to play by ear. And then people like my dad who learned to play by ear but had never learned how to play by music. Amazing and excellent one-dimensional piano players because that, that you have to have a desire to, to continue to grow in that, not just make an impression for other people, but to actually grow in it. It's the difference between dabbling in your faith of receiving God's grace and dedicating your life to responding in that grace beyond surface level, but actually practicing putting on the character of Christ's likeness. Peter talks about that kind of difference, but in the context of our faith. He's saying, look, you've been given this incredible gift of faith in Jesus, but if you're not growing, you're not developing, you're missing out on becoming who you've meant, who you're meant to be. You practice the scales. Your fingers stumble over the keys. And the more you practice, the better you get. And over time, you develop finger dexterity. You start developing muscle memory. You begin playing the notes better and better, but what happens if you stop? What happens if you never move past the first couple songs? I can get down there and knock your socks off with two songs and not play another note. I mean, you would actually think, see, this is what happens in the life of the church. You'll meet someone and start getting to know them a little bit and think, oh man, they're a beautiful Christian in the grace and the image of God, and, and they'll say, Oh, I love the way they talk about that doctrine. I love the way they pray. I love the way they read Scripture. And, and, and you say, okay, uh, and you start getting to know them a little bit, and you realize, wow, they can't even play chopsticks in the faith. I can't play chopsticks. I, I, there's another song I can play, and I can play and sing that entire song. And I, and, and, but I, I can't do anything else. And when you just participate in the life of the church by walking in three minutes before the service starts or eight minutes after the service has started, and you cut out to your car as quick as you can, and you go back to your little secluded life the best you can, in your faith, you may be able to stand up in front of everyone and play a, a beautiful chord progression, be like, wow, that, that's, Peter's like, no, 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 no. That's not what we're after in the life of believers. Peter's telling us that our faith is a lot like this. It's, it's not about that first moment when you believed in those few basic things you've learned about the faith and the, the few doctrines of whatever church you were accepted Christ in, those few first couple doctrines that they drilled into you. It's about growing and building on those foundations. And Peter is warning you today against spiritual stagnation, against becoming the person who knows a couple of songs in your faith and you never become a musician playing out the character of Christ each day in your life. He's saying if you're not developing your faith, you're like the believer who just plays chopsticks or just plays those two journey songs and everyone else thinks you're a piano player and you are, you're right with God. He's given you all of that, but Peter's Final words out of chapter one are make every effort. If you don't grow in these areas, if you stop practicing, if you stop developing, it means you are spiritually short-sighted. So don't settle for just playing a couple of songs. Don't be the person who knows enough just to get by, to look like you've got it all together when you're at a church function. Keep practicing, keep growing, keep participating. Stop making excuses for your lack of Christ-like character in different situations and become a true musician who's living out the ability that God has given you to become a piano player for Christ. Amen? Let's stand and pray together this morning. Where are you in becoming a piano player for Christ? He has given you at the acceptance of him, all of the promises and grace that you need. And then Peter says, for what? 
as an escape route to heaven as the world burns to hell? Well, that's, an, that's one advantage. But Peter, who's about to die, look at me, we're still praying. Peter, as, we're about, as he's about to die, says, yes, you, you've been given that grace, but you've been given it to individually take on and continue to make every effort to grow in Christ's likeness and Christ's character. And then imagine as all of us in our different levels of piano playing in the faith, we all continue to, go, to grow what that does for the music that the world gets to hear from New Start Church. Some of us who are learning to play chopsticks, some of us who are playing Beethoven, and none of us who are faking that we play the piano because we know two songs. Amen? So God, we surrender that to you right now. 